Well, that really was, that was the first song that I ever learned to play. What a friend we have in Jesus. Thank you, band, for doing that. That was kind of cool. I didn't know they were going to do that until uh, today. And, and I, I thought, man, that is, that's special, man. I, I remember learning that this, uh, this old, uh, this old guy in our church, his name is Brother Womack. I still remember. He could play the piano like nobody's business, but he would tell you that he was actually a drummer. He was, I was like, you're, you're really a drummer, but you play the piano like that. That's pretty intense. Now, he didn't like read music or anything like that. He just kind of got after it on the piano, and he could play all those old songs. And I said to him one time, I was like, I want to learn to play an instrument, too. I want to play up here on the band, with the band. I had been playing the harmonica, but, I mean, how hard was that, right? I'm just going <laughs> with my grandpa, and everybody's making believe like it sounds good. But um, I, I, I wanted to learn, and, and so he goes, I got it just for you. Come meet with me. Um, we'll meet. Uh, before the service tonight. And so he brings out this old blue bass that was there. It was, it was this kind of electric blue color. And he goes, all right, here's this thing, this thing. And you had to do it. It was like a boom, 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 boom. Because it was a boom chuck sound, right? Like, and you can kind of hear it in your brain. And, and, and he's like, all right, you're going to play this way and this way. And you're going to go, doom, 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 doom. A little, he called it a run. I'd never heard of something like that. And I thought, I would like to do that. I don't think my fingers will do it. He said, just practice. Just practice a little bit. But here's the problem. Your boy doesn't like to practice. I don't like to practice things. I don't like to study either. I, like, I always liked school, but I never really preferred studying. I didn't, I didn't like studying or anything like that. You, you know what I mean? You, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I've always loved being able to, to talk about ideas and think through the ideas and have discussions and learn new things. But the, it's not appealing to me to sit and pour over notes. Right? It's never been super appealing to me to, to pour over, over notes and, and over uh, books and write notes in the margin. That, that's never been a thing I really, really wanted to do. Some people, you really like that sort of thing. That is your idea of a great Sunday afternoon. Not for me. Not for me. And the reason is because I can't focus my attention on anything for that long. As my fourth grade teacher once said, I have the attention span of a gnat. Right? I, I, I just can't focus that long on things. And so even today, I, I, I think about all the places my life has taken me where I've had to try and, and learn to focus on stuff. I, I was one of the original riddling kids in the 90s, right? Like I'm in second grade and they're going, this kid needs medication. This kid right here, he needs some medicine to help him focus at all. And because I would, I would take a test, it'd be, it'd be front and back, front and back on a piece of paper. And I would ace the first half, but I wouldn't even fill out the second half. I wouldn't turn the sheet over. Because by the time I got done with the first page, I'd look up and I'd see a bird out the window, or I'd hear somebody tapping their pencil to a beat that I had heard on the radio earlier that day, and I just lost focus, and I'd turn the paper in and go on about my merry day. I mean, even today, if, if I go to a restaurant with you, for instance, you, some of you have experienced this with me, if I go to a restaurant with you, I'm listening to five different conversations at once, and I'm watching people walking by inside and outside seeing if I know them. I, it's so hard for me to focus. So I have to look at you intently as you're talking and really focus in on what you're saying. It's difficult. It, it, it's a difficult thing. Sometimes I, I can get so distracted that I find myself doing weird stuff. You know what I mean? Weird stuff. Like I'll be thinking about food, but I'll have my keys in my hand. And next thing I know, I'm putting my keys in the refrigerator and walking off. But what did I do with my keys? What? And there are here in the office, the, the people who work in the office with me, they'll tell you, I'll, I'll get up from my office to walk over to your office to talk to you about something. And I will forget nine times out of 10, I'm forgetting what it is I'm, I'm going to say to you. All right, so as you might imagine, this forgetfulness, this, this kind of lack of the ability to focus on things has led to a lot of late nights and a lot of procrastination on my part. A lot of late nights, a lot of procrastination on my part, especially in school, because I was not focused on homework or doing papers or anything like that. There was a lot of procrastination, a lot of late nights until I learned the secret for studying, at least for me. The secret is, all studying is, is putting what you're studying in front of you enough that your mind begins to kind of conform to it, to form around it. When I learned that, it made things a little bit easier. But let me ask you a question, right? If, especially if you haven't been in school for a while. If you haven't been in school for a while, uh, but even if you are in college or in middle school or in high school, let me ask you this question. When was the last time you studied anything, like really? Like you really studied something? 
really study. Because finding yourself in like a Wikipedia wormhole where you're just trying to Google and find out how much, uh, how many episodes of The Office Will Ferrell was in and, and which ones of them they were, and then just cross-referencing that with like his biographical information and then cross-referencing that with his dad's biographical information and then getting lost in a series of, and, and learning more about the TV series MASH, all of that. That's, you might call that research, but you can't call that study. That's not study. Study is real, academic, hard work. And here's the thing about real, academic, hard work. That's when study's not fun. No, I don't like doing that. That's when most people say, I, I, I would rather not. Because we really like to study the stuff that we like. We don't prefer to study the things that we don't like. We get bored by that stuff. We, our lack of focus gets magnified in those moments. But when you can study the things you care about, the things you're interested in, things change. I remember when I started studying history in college, I no longer had to take the freshman English classes or anything like that. I could study history, which was my major. I loved it, man. I came to life. I didn't even really have to like study at home that much because I was so engaged with the books and what the teacher was saying in the class. I, it was awesome for me. Well, today we're in the middle of a series called Spiritual, Not Religious. And the whole idea of this series is we want to give you spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines that anyone can do. No matter where you fall on the spiritual spectrum, if you want to grow closer to God, you can do these spiritual practices practices, and you will grow closer to God. Today, we're talking about, you guessed it, study. Study, yay. Study, all right? And in order to do that, we have to talk about a couple of sisters. Now, I hope you aren't surprised to learn that our Lord and Savior, Jesus, had friends. A lot of times, we think of Jesus as just this 30-year-old guy who appeared out of nowhere, And he walked up to a group of 12 other 30-year-old guys and looked at them and said, hey, y'all come follow me. And then kind of like the Pied Piper, he led them all off into the wilderness and eventually to to their death. But that's not how things went down, right? Like we just came out of Christmas. We know there was a baby Jesus and he grew up and then there was a 12-year-old Jesus and then went on. And then he comes on the scene again about 30 years old and he tells people to follow him. But Jesus was a normal person just like you and me. He also happened to be the son of God but he interacted with people, with others, as a normal person. And he had friends. He had friends just like you, just like me. And three of those friends were siblings. Their names were Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. If you're familiar with the story of Lazarus, Lazarus um, dies at one point, and Jesus has to go and eventually raises him from the dead. It's, these are the same people we're talking about. Mary and Martha are his friends, and they go to him and they say, hey, Jesus, you should have been here. You could have done something about this. These are friends. Well, an early Christian writer named Luke uh, describes kind of uh, their relationship in a story that he tells uh, in the 10th chapter of his gospel. So let's look at that story together. Luke says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. Now, Luke doesn't come right out and say, Martha, his friend. But we know from other biblical writers and and Christian history that Martha and Mary and Lazarus were friends with Jesus. So when Jesus is coming through, he's coming through actually with a lot of people, and he stops off at Martha's house, and she says, yeah, come on in. Now, what you don't know is, uh, just a little bit before this story, Jesus has been with 72 other disciples. There weren't always just 12 people around. He had his inner 12 that were with him, but uh, there were oftentimes a lot of other people who would count themselves as disciples who wanted to follow Jesus. And so Jesus sends 72 of these people out into the villages, into the towns, and says, hey, go tell them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go tell them all of that. And when you show up, if they welcome you in, stay there with them. Don't leave. Try to go to a better place or anything like that. Do that. So when he shows up to Martha's town and she says, come on in, he's following his own advice by staying there with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Now, Martha is that friend in the friend group that's hospitable. But you know, you know the friend I'm talking about, the one who always likes to have 
everyone over to their house. The one whose house is immaculate when you show up, they, they bake fresh cookies when they know you're coming, right? They, these are the ones who are really into making charcuterie boards and uh, things like that, you know, like these nice decadent charcuterie boards. They got live, laugh, and love somewhere on a sign in their house, right? They're, these are the ones, they have the softest hand towels money can buy in the guest bathroom just for you when you come over. She's that friend. She's awesome. She's also doing what the culture of the day expected her to do. As a woman, her role was to make sure that she provided stuff like charcuterie boards, I guess, to people who came by asking for them. But then there's her sister. She had a sister called Mary in the next verse, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, you, you think yeah, that's a good thing, right? That, that's a really good thing. Now, I know some of you, you've been in church long enough or you've been around church enough that you've heard this message preached a couple hundred times. You know exactly where I'm going to be heading with this message, don't you? You already know. You've already started tuning me out a little bit because you know that I'm going to say, well, Martha was doing all of this work and Mary sat down. So Martha got upset and Martha uh, went over and said, hey, you need to start helping me. Jesus, make her help me. And Jesus said, no, Martha, worshiping me is more important because Jesus apparently needed that kind of affirmation in his life. Well, if that's you, you're wrong. That's not what I'm going to say right now. It's only half the story because here's the other real half of the story. Martha is upset with Mary in large part because Mary's acting like a man. Mary's doing what men do, not what women were supposed to do. Mary is supposed to be helping Martha and the other ladies in the kitchen. We're talking, there's probably 60, 70 people who showed up to Martha's house. She's got a lot to get done. And here's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Women were not allowed to do this in those days. Women weren't disciples in those days. Men sat at the feet of the teacher. Isn't it interesting that from the very beginning in Jesus's ministry, he elevates the status of women. Isn't it interesting? See, if, if, if you don't understand the context, you, you miss that. He elevates the status of women. Because if you can be a disciple, if you can sit there like a disciple, you can be a disciple. And if you can be a disciple, well, then eventually you can be a teacher. Eventually you can be a rabbi. So from the very beginning, Jesus is not shooing away a woman who would like to be a teacher, or at the very least, who wants to know more. Back to the story. Like most people, Martha uh, doesn't just get mad at one thing, right? When you get upset, when you finally kind of blow your top, it's never over one thing, is it? It's usually over multiple things. It's usually layers of things. So while she is upset with Mary for acting like a man and probably bringing shame upon their house. It's more than that. She looks around and sees 60, 70, maybe 80 people who've come here and she's welcomed them to their house. And Mary is just sitting there doing what she's culturally not allowed to do. And she says, I got all this stuff to do. Who's going to help me? Look what she says in the very next verse. She says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Lord, don't you care? I'm doing all of this work for you. I'm doing all of this stuff for you. Don't you care? Tell her to help me. Isn't that the way it goes? In our proud Christian moments. God, I'm doing all of this work. Send somebody to help me. Make these other people help me. Make them feel bad. Guilt them into it. But look at Jesus' response. Right? Because we think God is going to be on our side because God wants us to take care of other people. God wants us to look after others and to work hard for the kingdom of God. But look at Jesus' response here. He says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset. Well, look at that word. About many things. You're worried and upset about many things. 
all kinds of stuff you're upset about. I can see it in your eyes. You got this that you're worried about and this that you're worried about. You're worried about Mary over here because she's sitting as a disciple. You're worried about the fact that you need help in the kitchen doing all of these. You're worried about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Essentially, he looks at her and says, you're worried about all of this stuff, Mary, but can I tell you something just with all the love I have in my heart? That don't matter. That's what we like to hear, right? When we get worked up about something, we're upset about something, you go to somebody and you're just ranting and raving and I wish they'd do this, they need to do this. I, I'm so upset about this. And they look back at you and go, yeah, you're blowing this way out of proportion. We love hearing that, don't we? You're blowing this way out of proportion. Don't worry about it. No. He says, only one thing is necessary. Only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better. So Mary has chosen that one thing. And it will not be taken away from her. Mary's chosen the one thing that's needed. Now, he doesn't come out and say it here. But we can infer it pretty easily, can't we? It's study. It's the study pattern of a disciple. Mary has chosen that, and it is better than all of the things that Martha is worried about. Everybody else and Martha, they agree. Mary should not be sitting there listening to Jesus like a man while Martha is doing all the things that culturally a woman was supposed to do. But Jesus, Jesus says, Mary's doing exactly what she should be doing, studying in the way a disciple should study. Now, the trouble is, when you and I talk about study in the context of church, most of us instantly go to Bible study in our mind, right? When I say study in church, you're thinking Bible study. And the real trouble with that is most of us don't know how to study the Bible. We don't say anything to anybody. We don't really admit that to anyone. But most of us don't really know how to study the Bible. And we just kind of go on through life hoping nobody notices. But study is something that can help us grow closer to God. It can transform our life. So it, it would serve us well to make sure we know how to study. So first things first. Study can be divided into two categories, verbal and nonverbal. So when we study this verbal stuff, What we're doing is we're studying things like books and and lectures, uh, what speakers say, maybe even going to some videos, things like that. So in our example this morning from the Gospel of Luke, Mary sits at Jesus' feet. She is engaging in verbal study. She's hearing what Jesus says and goes on like that. Now, when it comes to verbal study, when it comes to verbal study, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, understand, we're trying to interpret, and we're trying to evaluate all the things that we're studying. So, so we go and we try to understand this. If it, we had a book, we try to understand the book that we're reading. And then we try to have uh, enough of an understanding to interpret what it is that we're reading. And then we try to get to a place where we can evaluate what it is we're reading. Is this good information? Is this right? This thing that I'm studying. Now that all sounds pretty easy, uh, but it's not unless you have a few extra tools in your toolkit. You need three other things going on. So when we're doing this, we we want to do is we want to have, um, when we're looking into verbal stuff, verbal study, we want to use our experience. We want to use other books and we want to use live discussion. Experience, other books, live discussion. These tools will help us get to a place where we can understand, interpret. What was that third one? (laughs) and evaluate. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? This all makes sense. We can use all of these things. This helps us to understand uh, how we're going to to learn something in the verbal, how we're going to understand, how we're going to interpret, how we're going to evaluate. We get this as we think about it. For instance, with experience. Say, say you were raised around cars. We're just going to pretend that you were raised around cars. 
And you know a lot of stuff about cars. Uh, maybe you don't know everything there is to know about cars, but you know a lot because uh, you used to hold a flashlight, like, like me. You used to hold a flashlight while your dad was, was changing stuff on the car and, and turning uh, screws and bolts and things like that. And you just kind of held still, but you watched. And maybe as you got a little bit older, you learned how to change a flat. You learned how to do this. You helped put on a serpentine belt, stuff like that. You wouldn't say you're a mechanic, but at the very least, you're not intimidated by cars, are you? You're not, you're not remotely intimidated by those things. Now, say you got this friend, and this friend is a genius. They're, they're way smarter than you. You freely admit that. But your friend was not raised around cars, were they? Your friend uh, lived a much more genteel life. They didn't have to do anything with their cars. They had people who did that for them. Now, if I were to take you, the one raised around cars, and uh, your friend, the one raised not around cars, who's very intimidated by cars, and I were to bring you to a, a parking lot, And in this parking lot, I had the same car. I I had two models of of, of the same car uh, right there for you. And I said, look, uh, here's a manual. Change the alternator. Who do you think is going to be more successful? The one with the experience, the one who's who's had cars in their life for a long time, the one who's not intimidated. It has nothing to do with intellect. It has everything to do with experience. We get this when we study ancient history, right? When we talk about other books. When when we study ancient history, for instance, it helps to have multiple sources to confirm things. If you've ever written a term paper, you know what that's about. You've got to have multiple sources to get the most complete understanding of the thing that you're studying. Anytime uh, I put together a a message, you can know that I'm going to have two, three, four, maybe even five commentaries open on just to the passage that we're studying that day. And I'm going to be comparing and contrasting so that I can get the most complete information that I could possibly get. Why? Because that helps me to study. That helps me to understand. Helps me to interpret. Helps me to evaluate. And of course, anyone who's ever taken a seminar class Uh, whether it be in middle school, high school, college, graduate school, whatever. If you've ever sat around in a seminar class where you're uh, talking about things that you've read or talking about ideas that you're pushing back and forth that day, you know that you learn a lot better when you can uh, verbalize your thoughts on things and hear from other people and you can take in other things they're saying. So that's one of the reasons we push community groups so hard here at Church on the Drive. We believe that it's best for you to be involved in a community group because that's where you can interact with other people. Look, I can talk all day and I can tell you all kinds of cool stuff, but the reality is uh, you're not going to take in everything that I say, right? And I can't let you just kind of pop your hand up and start talking questions and, because that'll mess up our decorum here. And then we've got people online who would love to be asking questions but can't hear yours either. And so it won't be a free give and take right now. But in community groups... In community groups, you have the opportunity to have live discussions about things, and it'll start to transform your heart. You'll be transformed by the very things that you're studying. So if you're not in a community group, get in a community group. Now, when we talk about studying verbal things, really what we're talking about a lot of times is books, books and lectures. And one of the first books that any Christian needs to study is... Oh, that's sad. Okay, everybody here, you're gonna. Have, I know people at home all said it with me just now, but I need the people in the room to say it with me. The first, one of the first books that people who follow Jesus need to make sure they're studying is the Bible. Thank you, thank you. I knew you knew the answer. I knew it. The Bible, man. Like, yeah, we got to study the Bible. But here's my caution to you. Here's my caution to you. Studying the Bible is not the same thing as devotional reading of the Bible right? Studying the Bible and devotional reading of the Bible are not the same things. So devotional reading of the Bible is a little bit more surface level, isn't it? It's a little bit more surface level. Uh, it's maybe you open up your, your journal or your devotional for that week and, or that day and you turn and you, you read a short passage of scripture and you think happy thoughts about it and you think, thank you God for saying that to me. And that has a place and that's a good thing. It's a great way to, to start your day and, and go throughout your day. Don't get me wrong. But studying the Bible involves this stuff, using your experience, other books, live discussion, 
so that you can understand what's in the Bible, you can interpret what's in the Bible, and you can evaluate what's in the Bible. Now, there are other books and lectures and uh, videos that we can all watch, but I think it's time for us to move on to the second category uh, of study, and that is the nonverbal stuff, the nonverbal kind. And what we mean by this is just an observation of reality around us. That's all that nonverbal study is, an observation of reality around us. So a great place to start is nature. We're talking about nonverbal study. Let's start with nature. I mean, when was the last time you really looked at a leaf? You ever walk outside, just pick up a leaf and start staring at it? Sure, your neighbors are probably judging you, but I mean, when was the last time you looked at a leaf and said, oh, that's interesting? Because you will, if, if you look at it. It's, it's intricately designed. There's all kinds of stuff going on with that leaf, right? If you just take a, take a second to look. There's ridges around the edges. There's these little um, veins that kind of go through this thing. There's probably a little hole or some bug ate through it. Where did it come from? Where did it fall down from? How far has it gone? Maybe you've watched ants, like a colony of ants, attack a piece of bread that got left behind at a picnic in a park. You ever see that? They take a little piece of crust, and there's like a thousand of them. They're just moving this piece of crust back to their ant bed. It's incredible to watch if you just sit still long enough to do it. And the point of nonverbal studies is to say, okay, how is this going to add value to my life? How is this going to add to to my understanding of the world? And then for the Christian, my understanding of God and what God is doing in the world and in me. We take this a step further. We start doing things like observing people. You ever go somewhere, back before COVID especially, you go somewhere and you just watch people? You watch the things that they do? I've been to the mall before and and just watched a a dad berate his, his daughter. Just berate her. And in a non judgmental way, right? I'm, I'm watching so that I can observe. And I'm, and I'm watching his face, and I'm watching her face, and I'm watching the faces of people around. And I go, I don't want to speak that way to my daughter. I don't want to speak that way to my kids. So we, we use these observations to grow us and to transform us. This is what we mean by non verbal study. So I wonder, what could we learn from observing creation? What what could I learn about myself and and my relationship with the God of the universe? What what could I learn about God's relationship with the rest of the world, what God wants to do in the world? What could I learn potentially about what God wants to do in the lives of people in the world by studying God's creation? So whether it's nonverbal or verbal study, the whole point is for us to grow closer to God. And so when we study, it's not this dumbed down, uh, you're not really going to pass, so your teacher just kind of gives you a free pass so you can move on to the next grade type of study. We're talking about meaty material. We're talking about real discussion, hard conversations, hard work, study, so that we can grow closer to the God of the universe, so that we uh, have more than just flimsy first grader theology that we got in Sunday school one time. Because as you and I know, when the real world comes at you, that flimsy, flimsy theology you got in first grade, it's good in first grade, but it's not great when you're 41. Now, this type of study can make people uncomfortable, can it? It can make people a little bit uncomfortable. When Mary was more committed to study than she was to doing the things that society thought she should do, that made her sister uncomfortable. But that's okay. That's okay because that was more important. That was the one thing needed. And Jesus said, this is what it's all about. So if it's that important, we better keep doing it going to help us to grow closer to God. See, real study is something that can change our lives. It can transform our lives and our relationship with God. So I hope that you always, always, always remember that real study makes a real God more real. Now, that isn't to say that that you can make, literally make God more real. I mean, you're making God more real to yourself and to other people through real study. 
Because the truth is that many of us believe in the God of the Bible, but we don't know how to believe it in a way that is believable to other people, let alone ourselves sometimes. You know, one of the criticisms that's been levied against the Christians uh, for, for a while now, especially in America over the last 50 to 100 years, is that we're anti-science. And when you look at what we've done, when you look at our track record over that time period, I'd say it's a fair assessment. But it doesn't have to be the assessment in the future. That can begin to change. For a lot of people in America, Christians are known as people who won't engage with honest debate. We won't engage uh, with honest atheistic debates, right? You and I, we probably all have people in our lives who don't believe in God or who have an alternative faith, right? A totally different faith from us. And we never engage or have conversations with them because we don't really know what what we're going to say. And so Christians all across America, right or wrong, we're known as people um, who just are going to retreat into our large tax-free buildings and keep talking to each other in our echo chamber. And many of us, right? Many of us have lots of questions and doubts that have never been addressed. We don't know how to deal with them. We don't even know where to start to deal with them. So we don't put in the effort to deal with these doubts and questions that we have. And we don't want to admit it to anybody else, especially the people we're in church around, because what will they think? And so what ends up happening is we hold on to this flimsy first grader theology, or worse, we abandon church altogether. But what if, what if Jesus' followers really gave themselves to real study? What if if Jesus' followers decided that real study makes a real God more real to me and to everybody else around me? What if we really decided we were going to figure this stuff out about our doubts, right? These things that, that we couldn't ever bring ourselves to say before. What if we decided that we were going to give ourselves to real Honest study, no matter how much focus it took, no matter how much, how painful it was, what if we gave ourselves to that level of study? What if we came up with defenses for our faith that caused people to go, hmm, instead of roll their eyes? What if we spent time trying to grow in our understanding of this God of the universe and how that God interacts with the entire world? I think two things would happen. I really do. I think two main things would happen. I think the first thing is this, that we'd see stronger Christians. I think we'd see stronger Christians, people who knew what they believed, why they believed it, and could tell others why they believed it, that it had been so ingrained in them that they could tell others. And I think that would lead us to the second thing. We'd see more Christians more Jesus followers. Because when you know a subject like that, when, you, when you're able to tell others about it, when you, can, you have enough of a grasp of that thing, it's a lot easier to tell people about it. It's a lot easier to tell people about it. I mean, think about your, your favorite um, movie, maybe, right? You, you've, you've watched this movie a million times, and you are kind of an evangelist for that movie. This is the greatest movie of all time. Let me tell you why. Shawshank Redemption played on this many shows for it, over and over and over. Or maybe for you, it, maybe a better one for you is like a football team. You really, really love, I don't know, the Texas Longhorns. Um, and you think that they're the greatest thing ever. And you've memorized all these stats and you have all these reasons why they are. So you are not shy about sharing with other football fans why the Texas Longhorns are the greatest and they should also like the Texas, football, uh, Texas Longhorns. Can you imagine if you knew as much about God, as much about the God in the Bible, much, as much about the Bible, as much as about theology as you do about movies, college football teams, your grandkids' soccer scores? I think we'd see more Christians, and I think we'd see stronger Christians. So my prayer for you is that you would give yourself to real authentic study 
and make those two things a reality. Would you pray with me for a second? Let's, let's bow our head and close our eyes together. Uh, here in the room and at home, pray with me. Block out those distractions for just a moment. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you give us all that we need to study. We thank you for wise mentors. We thank you for wise teachers in our life. We thank you uh, for books that you've made available to us. We thank you um, that we can access those online or in a more tactile uh, form. I pray, God, that you would give us the wisdom, that you would give us uh, a push to go and actually really study. Give us courage to go and do that too. Help us to be stronger followers of Jesus who make more followers of Jesus. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.